Okay, thank you very much, Barbara. Um, so I'm going to give you a very quick tour through some of the work that I'm doing um, with my collaborator, Jeff Manley, at UC San Francisco. And these are some of the other people. There are junior doctors, there are nurses, there are computer science graduate students, uh, all doing their best to talk to each other. Uh, so this is an example of an intensive care unit. Um, it's sort of human-centered. There is actually a human being in the center, uh, the very small one. And um, so all of these devices are there to keep, uh, keep that human being alive. Some of them to uh, work on the human being, supplying uh, drips and, and ventilation and so on. Some of them to report information to the nurses and doctors who work with these patients. Um, so what we're trying to do is to understand this entire system uh, from a mathematical point of view and use that mathemat mathematical understanding to make sense of the data that's collected so that we can improve the quality of healthcare decisions. So critical care in the US is $300 billion a year, uh, which just for comparison is about the same size as the worldwide semiconductor industry. Um, and uh, needless to say, if you're in critical care, you don't always get well. So a lot of people die, a lot of people leave uh, intensive care with lifelong impairments. So we would like to improve the outcomes, reduce the length of stay, therefore reducing costs, um, and at the same time, uh, do some of the science needed to understand what's going on. And um, So this isn't just a, a place of treatment, this is also a laboratory. So we are able to gather data from these patients uh, at high rates of information. We're putting them into a repository, which shortly will go online. Uh, it's fairly small right now, just about 60 gigabytes, but it's, uh, it's growing very fast. We have 16 beds that are wired up, uh, generating data the, the entire time. And we're bringing in more institutions from around the world. Um, and for this audience, I don't need to say that you can only imagine how difficult it is to get the city and county of San Francisco, the University of California, the San Francisco General Hospital, uh, and, and um, uh, the various agencies involved in data privacy to agree that we can put this data online and make it available for research. Um, but I think we've managed to do that. So one of the main things we're trying to do with this data that's being collected is instead of the data just going off and warming up the walls of the of the hospital room, which is what happens right now. The screens just glow and show the data, and the nurses might not even be in the room. Uh, you know, Occasionally, they'll glance at the monitors. Once an hour, they'll take a little note on a piece of paper. Once a day, they'll share those notes with the doctor who comes in every morning. Um, and you know, they, an entire day's worth of data is reduced, not, sorry, an entire week's worth of data is reduced to a, a doctor's notes on a three by five card. So that is the standard of care in most intensive care units around the world. But um, there's a lot of data here, and we can use it. So there's about 140 fields describing the patient on entry. Um, about 40 measurements are being taken in real time, some as fast as 125 hertz. And there are about 1,500 asynchronous measurements that can be taken and, and uh, events that can occur to the patient, such as administrations of drugs. And we're interested in taking that information and computing um, the posterior probability over the state of the patient. So if we could, roughly there are about 100 state variables that you're interested in that describe various uh, aspects of the pathophysiology that's going on in the patient, and we want to compute a distribution over those variables given all this data. Um, and the methodology, I don't want to go into too much detail, but if you're interested, ask me afterwards. We have dynamic Bayesian network models that represent the the, if you like, the, the physics of how uh, patients and sensors operate. Um, these models are stochastic, and they include models of the sensor dynamics, which is very important because the data that's generated is incredibly noisy, incredibly subject to interruptions and interventions by nurses. All of these things create uh, artifacts in the data that um, if you just took them at face value, you would assume the patient had died many times uh, during their stay in, in the hospital. Um, so just to compare, the, the history of modeling in medicine, mathematical modeling in medicine, is an interesting one. Up until the early 70s, it was one of the pinnacles of 
medical science was to build these big dynamical system models of physiology, and they, they built special purpose computers to run them, and so on. And then all of a sudden, once DNA got going, uh, medicine became molecular, or at least uh, a lot of medical research became molecular, and interest in uh, mathematical modeling at the organ and physiological level disappeared. Um, and one reason for that is that those kinds of deterministic differential equation models are completely unusable for clinical application. They, they describe some fictitious patient who is completely predictable. With a deterministic dynamical systems, systems model of a patient, there's never any need to make any observations because given the initial conditions, you know exactly what the patient will be like in six weeks' time. Um, so it's simply that kind of mathematical approach simply doesn't work, and we're hoping that with, with these more sophisticated probabilistic models that include sensors, uh, we're actually going to be able to revive the use of, of modeling in clinical practice. Okay, so um, this is a high-level overview of the entire mo uh, model of human physiology. There are 13 major areas, and these, the connections, which you probably can't read, uh, indicate the ways in which those 13 major areas of human physiology are connected. So I'll just show you a little piece, the one with the black box around, the cardiovascular model. I'll just show a little piece of that model, um, which basically relates uh, parts of the brain. There's a part of the brain, that the medullary control center, that's responsible for taking inputs about uh, the, uh, for example, the blood pressure, and then sending out neurotransmitters so that the heart increases its pumping rate or decreases its pumping rate so that the uh, arterioles open or close, so you can actually, re the brain regulates the pressure uh, of the blood. And so this shows that whole system um, operating. So this, this is um, a dynamical systems model, so it describes how this, the system changes over time. So this would be at one time on the left and then at the next time step on the right. And this one down here is the baroreceptor. This is where the body measures its own blood pressure and then sends a signal to the brain uh, saying, well, blood pressure is too high. We need to slow things down or uh, open up some valves or whatever, whatever it is that the response might be. The model also includes, I'm afraid the, oh, this, this display doesn't have my color. Um, OK, I won't explain that because it's completely invisible. Um, the model also includes the sensors. So all the orange things are sensors. There's a heart rate sensor. Uh, there are various kinds of blood pressure sensors. And the model includes drugs. So here's, uh, here's where phenylephrine acts. It acts to modify one of the neurotransmitters uh, that control heart rate and blood pressure. And so one of the things we can do is from observing the patient, we can actually determine by basically inverting this model, we can determine what drug was applied. So that when there's a medical error and someone gets the wrong drug, we can say, this drug does not match what the drug administration record says was injected. And you need to check and go and see what it really was. And sometimes we can even identify the drug. At least that's the plan. Um, we hope to demonstrate that fairly soon. Um, so as I mentioned before, real data are messy. Here's, um, here's a period of about 16 hours from one patient. Up the top, we have the various blood pressures. Uh, in the middle, we have blood gases and temperatures. And down the bottom, we have all the ventilator measurements. And Basically, visually, when you look at this data, most of what you're seeing is actually artifact. Okay, so all of these big spikes in the pressure, you might think, oh my goodness, look, you know, the blood pressure really went up or the blood pressure really went down. No, it didn't. Actually, that was someone drawing blood from the line. And when you draw blood from the line, the blood pressure goes way up. Or sometimes they re-zero the, um, they re-zero the blood pressure monitors or they, um, they attach something to the ventilator so that, uh, to help clear out the patient's lungs, and that changes the apparent volume of the patient's lungs by 40%. And then all of a sudden, you're, you're saying that the patient is breathing 40% more when they're not actually breathing more at all. So you really have to understand all of these spikes here uh, basically is coughing. So when the patient coughs, it looks like their lungs are getting really stiff. But in fact, that's not uh, actually happening. So you need to understand the sensors. You need to understand the ways that data gets corrupted. Um, so this is a little piece of a dynamical Bayes net model that describes how the blood pressure monitor works and describes what happens when a blood draw is taken. And then when we look at the actual data, which might look like this, so the, this is the systolic on the top, the diastolic on the bottom, the mean uh, blood pressure. And 
when a blood draw is taken, you, you see this kind of spike. Okay? And the shape of the spike varies enormously depending on how long the, um, how long the uh, blood draw took. Sometimes a blood draw can take less than 10 seconds to take a blood sample from the line. Sometimes it can take two or three minutes. So, um, so the shapes and durations of these, these kinds of aberrations uh, vary enormously. But if you have a model of how they really work, you can detect them very reliably despite this enormous variation in the, uh, in the shape of the behavior. Um, so here you see that the system has correctly determined that in, this, uh, in the first of these, these three minute period here, there's actually two different blood draw events. And one took about 50 seconds. The other one took about 30 seconds. And the system is inferring uh, those durations and uh, locations correctly. Uh, and then um, on the, in the orange part in here, this shows the inferred blood pressure during that event. So the system is able to infer what was happening to the blood pressure even when the blood pressure measurement was going completely haywire uh, because of the uh, blood draw taking place. Um, so we recently did a comparison of our technique compared to the state of the art. The state of the art is roughly 60% accurate in detecting these kinds of aberrations. Our, our modeling approach is 98.8% accurate. OK, so this just shows some, uh, some of the problems that arise when you have artifacts. Here's the blood pressure data over a two-day period. And every time the blood pressure goes into the, the yellow regions, the alarm sounds in the intensive care unit. And uh, at least in California, the nurses are legally required to go and attend to that alarm, not supposed to ignore it. Uh, in fact, they do ignore it, or they just switch the alarm off altogether so that it doesn't work, um, because uh, in many cases, up to 95% of the alarms are false alarms. And that was true with this two-day period of data. So after we process it using the techniques, um, we can see that all, all of those spikes go away, with the exception of seven excursions. There's six up here and one down there. And all of those were real alarms. So our system, in this case, was 100% accurate in detecting the false alarms and, and, uh, and also the real alarms. Um, so we think that in practice, we can get the ICU false alarm rate down uh, to below 5%. And here are some of the kinds of inferences that we can start to do um, by this mathematical modeling approach. So we can infer the vascular stiffness of the patient from the measurements that we're taking over time. And that's extremely important. For example, with diabetic patients, the arteries become quite stiff. And so that means that if you put, no matter how much of these vasopressor drugs you put in, which are supposed to cause the arteries to clamp down, because they're stiff, they won't really move very much. So you'll treat a patient who has stiff arteries very differently from one that has elastic arteries. Um, erroneous drug administration I already mentioned. So pulmonary artery pressure is a very important one uh, for patients in intensive care. Um, and it's extremely difficult to measure. Basically, the way you do it is you thread a catheter in through the leg, up through the vena cava, through the heart, out the other side of the heart, all the way through the heart, out the other side of the heart, into the pulmonary artery, and then you lodge it uh, in one of the branches of the pulmonary artery as it goes into the lung. Um, and you kill the patient about 1% of the time when you do that, just to obtain a measurement. And that measurement is crucial particularly for, for knowing when a patient is going into shock, knowing how to treat them, at least as I understand it, um, they feel a need to do these measurements. Um, but because of uh, the kind of stochastic modeling that's adaptive to the particular patient that we do, uh, we're able to estimate the pulmonary artery pressure fairly accurately without inserting any devices whatsoever. So that's a nice thing. Um, we're trying to build this. Um, model out right now. It's mainly cardiovascular. We're trying to build it out to all the other uh, systems. In, uh, the immune system is probably the most difficult, but is very important for the intensive care because um, multiple organ failure is one of the main causes of death, and that's uh, thought to be uh, a, a function of inflammation as well as infection. Um, and finally, then, connecting these kind of physiological level models down to uh, the Molecular, molecular level models that everyone has been doing research on for the last 30 years in biomedicine, then I think we can start to allow uh, all of those innovations at the molecular level to have clinical impact in terms of new therapies. So that, those are our goals. And that's, that was my presentation. OK.
All right. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Douglas. I'm here on campus in UC Berkeley. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about a project that we're calling the Cellscope. And the idea is to do uh, telemicroscopy. We've heard a lot about some other um, uh, approaches to, to, to telemedicine, but I hope to convince you that microscopy is another application that uh, could really benefit from, from uh, being able to be done remotely. So um, light, light microscopy is a, is a you know, central tool for, for diagnostics. Um, you know, you show up at a doctor's office, as in The Simpsons here, and uh, he's got a variety of tools he can use for, for diagnosis, but you know, we've, we've probably all had you know, fluids or biopsy samples um, analyzed via microscopy, which then leads to uh, you know the uh, course of treatment based on that. Um, you know, and there's there's a lot of different tests that that you can often do for the same you know the same possible disease, but uh, microscopy is is oftentimes the 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 gold standard for really identifying what the problem is, um, which is which is great if you have a microscope like this. You know, this is an an example of of a system that you know could be used in a clinic. These are uh, these are very powerful and very expensive, and uh, the way you know it, it often works, say, for a blood smear, is um, you know somebody draws a sample of blood, which um, is then processed on a slide. There's some staining, and uh, based on the staining and the analysis in the microscope, they're able to detect you know what's what's present in the blood. Um, for example, this is a this is a, a malaria slide, and you can see you know so here are the here are the blood cells, and then here within there, you can see the little uh, malaria parasites lighting up in, in blue. Which you know the way that that this would take place here would be you know in the in the same way they they take that blood sample, they'd stain it. Um, there'd be you know someone with a lot of training and, and experience whose uh, job it is to, to process this sample and you know detect whether or not the bugs are in the cells. Um, but that takes a lot of a lot of infrastructure. It takes both that that expertise, and it also takes you know those those expensive microscopes. Um, the thing about malaria is that it doesn't tend to overlap with where that infrastructure exists, right? So here's a here's a map that we borrowed from the UN Millennium Project showing the uh, global distribution of, of of physicians. So per per thousand people in the in the U.S. and Europe and Russia and you know a lot, a lot of other places we have. A good number of doctors, over two and a half doctors uh, per thousand people. But you can see that in a lot of places, you know, and especially uh, Central Africa, there there are quite a bit fewer. Um, I'm going to talk some more in a in a few minutes about um, an experience in Congo. But in in uh, Eastern uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, where I was working, there are uh, about one doctor per 160,000 people, which is it's pretty staggering. I mean, we're you know in in Berkeley, where we are right now, it's a city of about 160,000 people. That'd be like if we had one doctor that treated all of Berkeley. You know, could, could you imagine the chaos? Or if we had, say, five doctors for San Francisco. And if we had you know, an earthquake once a month, an ongoing civil war, and a lot of the other things that, that uh, are at play in some of these places. So what, what um, our group has, has proposed and is, is working on to address this need uh, we're, we're calling um, the cell scope, which is for uh, cell phone based telemicroscopy, which would you know we would have uh, a healthcare worker somewhere somewhere remote somewhere where they don't have the same you know level of, of diagnostic infrastructure be able to take a sample and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get into the the prototype a little more in a minute, but be able to take a sample and analyze you know take take the uh, take the mic the um, the microscopy images that are of, of you know, diagnostic quality using the camera on the cell phone uh, microscope attachment and then possibly um, either process that directly on the phone using, you know, the phones are in, increasing in, in processing power or to be able to use the cell phone network which is, which is great in a lot of these places um, to be able to transmit those images where, you know, in, in the cases where it does really requ require a you know, trained diagnostician to analyze the images. And that could be used both for you know, the, the initial diagnosis and for um, ongoing monitoring of some of these conditions. So this is, this is kind of the concept drawing um, we've got here. So there's you know, off-the-shelf uh, cell phone that, that we've been working with from, from Nokia. And um, you know, we, we made this sort of holster for the phone that uh, um, it, it, was, it was actually based on a 
based on a belt clip, you know, so it's a very sort of readily accessible technology. Um, and, uh, you know, applied, applied some microscope lenses uh, to, you know, turn this, turn this cell phone camera into a, into a diagnostic platform technology. Um, and then having the slide holder on the end there, being able to work within the same sort of diagnostic regime of, you know, taking the blood sample or sputum sample or whatever, putting that in the slide and analyzing that with the, the cell phone microscope. Uh, this was our, our initial prototype where, you know, done in the lab, we've got our, our optical breadboard set up so that we can, you know, move all our components around, get the focal lengths just right, um, which, you know, is a, is a little cumbersome to, to take on a field test. So we, uh, but we, we, we uh, demonstrated the initial feasibility with, with prototypes like this and then went on to develop uh, this prototype, which, which we've actually taken out, which is, you know, that, that, that same concept drawing in reality, we've got a hand model here with the, uh, with the phone, this longer tube lens to account for the you know, off-the-shelf optics, and then uh, a sample holder down at the end. And we've been able to, to get some really nice quality images that uh, I'll come to in a second. And so this is, this is an example of the, of, of the high magnification uh, application. You know, a, a lot of these, malaria, for example, you want you know, 60, 100x magnification. Um, in some in some instances, you know, you want sort of lower magnification. Maybe it's a it's a dermatological condition, something that you know just the camera won't quite do. But you only want you know kind of like a, a micro or a magnifying glass level of, of magnification. And so we've also got a got a prototype that has um, uh, less magnification and built-in illumination system. And uh, you know this this is all great if it if it works. So here's our. Here's our demonstration of um, uh, just a, a normal blood sample where, you know, here's on, uh, on your right is, you know, the um, blood smear with a, a standard lab quality microscope. And then on the left is the same sample uh, image through our, through our cell, sco cell scope system. So we're able to get, um, you know, real lab quality, clinical quality diagnostic images with this, with this system. Um, and that you know, and this this is a this is a healthy sample, but you know some of these diseases that we want to look at, like like malaria, um, are are harder to do. Um, but we've also demonstrated that we can get these samples to work. So this is th this is a malaria sample that that we got from some collaborators at UCSF, and we've been able to to um, you know produce these diagnostic quality images of the malaria parasites within the blood cells. So. We can make it work in the lab. Uh, the, the, the next step is to refine it based on the actual in-the-field conditions. Um, and I, I got a chance to do a little bit of that this summer going over to uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. I was working in a city with a star there called Goma. Uh, Goma's right on the border of um, Congo and Rwanda in, in eastern Congo. And Goma is, uh, is a naturally beautiful city. It's right on uh, Lake Kivu. Um, uh, I'm here on behalf of the Goma Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> it's uh, one of Africa's great lakes, it's, you know, gardens and flowers. And um, there's also a giant volcano and the remnants of their decade-long civil war and the you know, spillover of other regional conflicts that are, you know, present incredible challenges for for um, any any healthcare services in that in that area. Um, and there's, you know, this has also led to. Uh, Huge numbers of, of both international refugees and internally displaced persons. The city that, that I was working in Goma is about 800,000, and they uh, had these internally displaced persons camps, owing to you know, some of the, the uh, conflicts, that had another 800,000 people living in, in, in these you know, very basic uh, conditions. And so there's a, a lot of reasons you might not want to go there, right? You know, there's, there's a there's violence. There's volcanoes. There's 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 reasons why there's not a lot of doctors and uh, not a lot of uh, a lot of development infrastructure. So it's a little dark, but uh, this is this is me, your intrepid narrator, here on top of the volcano. Um, and uh, you know, for maybe you guys aren't surprised, but uh, I was I was incredibly surprised that. Uh, we were able to make cell phone calls from on top of the volcano. <laughs> like, we climbed up this volcano, there's nothing around, it's, you know, like sulfur bubbling, the lava's down below, and uh, w one of my friends was, was calling the driver to get him to come pick us up. Uh, so, 
Well, there's not a lot of diagnostic infrastructure. There really is the, the infrastructure that's necessary for implementing this you know, cell phone-based technology. Um, and so, you know, just to sort of get a sense of, of what, the, what the need level was there, you know, this is, uh, I, was, I, was, I was talking to some people who do um, TB diagnostics in, in Goma. And Goma is really the, the, the biggest city in eastern Congo. And, you know, they, there's, in, the, in the eastern Congo area, there's, there's you know, uh, millions of people. And this, this facility here, this, this one microscope, and as you can see, this, uh, this one note card, um, provide the uh, TB diagnostic capability for that whole region. You know, it's, it's, it's one guy with a microscope, not a lot of record keeping. You know, but, I mean, it's, it's, they're, they're, they're doing really well with the, with the resources they have, but they were really excited to see um, what, what we were presenting. You know, they think this is, this is me giving a demo to um, some of the guys at the, at the Goma General Hospital talking about the, the applications for you know, doing, doing cell phone-based diagnostics. And they liked both you know, being able to uh, sort of transfer some of that burden, both you know, d having, having some of the diagnostics be automated, but also you know, being able to sort of be involved in the international collaboration, being able to you know, be part of re research partnerships with, with people by being able to transmit the images. And I, I got a, a just incredibly positive response to, um, to the presentations there. So just to just kind of wrap it up, I mean, the, the idea here is that the cell phone infrastructure is great in a lot of places where there's not a lot else. You know, in Congo, there's 300 miles of roads, um, but cell phone signals everywhere. And so if we, can, if we can use that infrastructure that exists to be able to take, you know, take these, these sophisticated diagnostics to people who, who need them desperately, I think it, it, it could have a tremendous impact. Um, this is some of the team that's working on it. Uh, I'm, uh, the group's led by Professor Dan Fletcher in bioengineering on campus. Um, some of the other people have had a lot of help from, from Ravi and Citrus. And uh, uh, yeah, well, uh, if you have any questions, I'd, I'd be happy to address them during the panel. And you can check out our website, cellscope.berkeley. Thanks. So good afternoon. Is this is on, right? Okay. Um, my name is Renata, and I'm from Purdue University, and I'm going to be speaking much more at a much more macro level. I'm going to be speaking about what I think industrial engineers can bring to healthcare. I'm going to tell you, give you two examples of some of the work I've done, and also I'm going to end the presentation by some of the area, illustrating some of the areas where I think industrial engineers can help in healthcare delivery. So, what do industrial engineers do? Um, we are trained to look at very complex systems. We are trained to develop mathematical models and quantitatively represent what may seem like an incomprehensible system. And traditionally, industrial engineers have been found in the manufacturing, logistics, and transportation sectors. And especially since World War II, in these sectors of the economy, we've seen a, a lot of improvements in productivity and efficiency, and in large part because industrial engineers have been in, the, in these sectors. Um, just to give you an example, in a manufacturing plant, you'll have hundreds of different product lines, you'll have millions of different parts, you'll have very expensive equipment, you'll have specialists that use this equipment, you'll have downtime, you have staff scheduling. So it's a very, very complex system in which industrial engineers have traditionally worked in. In a manufacturing, in a manufacturing plant, you'll have process engineers, you'll have quality engineers, you'll have design engineers, you'll have industrial engineers, and these are all very technically skilled people, and their sole responsibility is to make sure that this manufacturing plant runs efficiently and effectively and, and, productive, and is able to um, achieve high productivity. And what I'm, what kind of the hypothesis is, is that healthcare does not have these people supporting their systems. And this is where I think industrial engineers can really make an impact. Um, so I'm coming from the Reagan Street Center for Healthcare Engineering, and this is at Purdue University. 
And what we're really trying to do here is bring together kind of three aspects of healthcare delivery. First is the clinical side, so the nurses, the, the pharmacists, the doctors. Secondly, bring together the management and the economics and the business side. And then third, bring in the engineering and the science and the computer science component and look at how we can improve healthcare delivery. And I want to give you three examples of things that I've worked on. Um, and one I'll go into greater detail than the other two. But I want to start with something I worked with uh, the Indiana State Department of Health. And this was also a joint effort with the CDC. And what we're interested in is determining how we can best provide services, how we can optimally provide services in the event of a pandemic event in the state of Indiana. And Indiana is an interesting place because we, there is a, a large rural community, but there are also very large urban centers. There's Gary outside of Chicago, um, there's Indianapolis, so we do have this mix. And in this particular project, we looked at um, where, we should, where we should put alternate care sites in the event of a pandemic and how to staff them. What type of equipment do we need? recognizing that there's going to be physicians who are ill, nurses who are ill, but where do we put these sites that we can reach the maximum amount of, of, of population and, how do, and what equipment do we need and what supplies do we need within these sites. Um, a second project that uh, I've been working on is actually looking at clinical scheduling. So I was working with a clinic in inner city Indianapolis and they actually had a no-show rate of about 40%. So 40% of their scheduled appointments would not come. So 40% of their scheduled patients would not show up, which of course has large revenue implications, utilization implications, and all that. So what we were able to do is statistically identify the factors of a patient that will indicate whether or not they will come to that appointment. So once we have identified these factors, what we can do is we can look at different types of policies. We can say, well, what if we double book like the airlines? What if we overbook, again, like the airlines? Um, what if we experiment with something called open access scheduling, so kind of a just-in-time approach to scheduling, which we've seen in manufacturing. And the nice thing about some of the industrial engineering tools is we're able to experiment a lot without actually going into the clinic and, sa and saying, hey, we've got a new, scheduling, um, a new scheduling policy. Let's play around with it in terms of mathematical and computer terms to see what happens. And I'm going to show you an example of what I mean by mathematical and computer um, examples. So the third project I wanted to kind of mention, and I'm going to spend more time on, is modeling patient flow. Um, and what I mean by mo what this project is, is what I'm particularly interested in is looking at the current state and the resource, limita resource limitations of my hospital and make s some sort of prediction about how these will evolve over the short term. So in English, what I mean by that is let's say it's nine o'clock in the morning on a Monday morning in a hospital. And I want to be able to know if at four o'clock in the afternoon, I'm, I will hit an ambulance diversion. So that's when the hospital closes its doors in the ED and cannot accept any more patients because it's full. So I'm interested in making these type of operational predictions, these, these, these types of operational decisions. Um, and once I'm able to quantify these decisions, I can make all sorts of different operational decisions, things such as staff scheduling, um, which patients should I transfer, um, should I call that emergency, should I call the ICU divert, should I call an ambulance divert, um, maybe housekeeping, should I, pr which, should I prioritize housekeeping, should I tell housekeeping where to go, maybe OR scheduling. So it's this type of short-term prediction and short-term forecasting that I'm interested in. And a lot of the bed managers I've been working with, they always tell me it's kind of a, a gut feeling. Like it's Monday morning, I have, a, I have a gut feeling that maybe we'll go and divert this afternoon. So what we're interested in is actually being able to quantify that and make a solid prediction of yes, whether or not you will reach that state. And not only that, what type of different policies can you put in place to avoid a state? And test these different policies um, in our models. So we begin by actually looking at the patient and understanding that the patient has, um, that if we can understand how a patient will flow for the system through the hospital, we can make a lot of sound predictions. And what we're doing is we're actually looking at HL7 messages. And HL7 um, is a protocol that is used between information systems within a hospital. 
So if a radiology system is communicating with the admission system, it's communicating with the pharmacy system, they communicate through a, a protocol called HL7. And our hypothesis is that these HL7 messages have a lot of information about a patient, and we can use this information to predict a hospital state. And to give you an example of what an HL7 message looks like, it's up here, but I can see that there's a lot of information. This, for example, William Jones, he was admitted, and it's an AO1 message, so that's what I can tell, at this particular time. So to give you, the hospital I'm working with, which is St. Vincent's in Birmingham, Alabama, they, they generate about a million of these messages every day. So there's messages for lab orders, for radiology, for diet. There's messages for vital signs, for um, you know, res lab results, for admission, discharge. So there's just this wealth of information sitting there, and it's all in the communication between different systems. And the beauty is a hospital doesn't have to have an electronic medical record system to have this information. All hospitals in the United States, and probably for most of the developed world, have these HL7 messages floating around. So what we're interested in doing is taking these messages and creating an expected pathway for a given patient type. So what I'm trying to say is I've gathered all this data for, let's say, DRG 558, which is a, a, a cath patient. What I want to be able to do is say, this is the expected path a, a heart cath patient will take through the hospital. At 9 o'clock, they're going to come in. By 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I expect them to use an, uh, an X-ray. By 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I expect them to have an EKG, and so on. So I'm beginning to, to develop these expected pathways for a patient type. And the next thing I'm able to do is I'm able to build a, a mathematical representation of a hospital system. And I can feed these expected patient paths into a model of a hospital system. And this is done with something called petri nets. And the nice thing about petri nets, it's, it's a form of graph theory. And it does look kind of funny, but this is, this is a hospital represented as a graph. And the nice thing about it is I can represent, use, I can use equations to represent a system. And as, with a simple set of equations like this, I can make predictions about this is where I am, this is what I, where I may be, and this is what I want to avoid, and what can I do to avoid these steps? And it looks kind of simple, but it is, I think it is a different way to represent a hospital and what happens in a hospital. So where I think this can come in place is we're able to look at things like um, bed availability at any given time. We're able to evaluate, and I know you can't really see these numbers, but we're able to evaluate the cost of certain types of operating policies. So I can see, maybe I can look at my bed availability, and then I can look at, well, what happens if I bring in more housekeeping? What happens if I let these nurses work overtime? So we're able to make these types of short-term, evaluate these types of short-term operational decisions. And I think this has a lot of implications for resource management at a hospital, um, for flow optimization, and what I mean by that is avoiding those bottlenecks in the ICU, in the emergency department. Um, we're able to have kind of short-term short decision-making availability, um, so we're able to kind of identify whether or not we will have a bottleneck. An interesting thing that's come out of some of this work is we're able to look at variation in clinical practice. Now, because I'm able to develop these kind of expected paths that a patient of a certain type will take, What's, in, what's become interesting for some of the nurses I'm working with is examining if a patient, if, let's say a heart-sent patient, begins to deviate off that path, and why are they deviating off that path? And the other interesting thing that's come out of this is patient safety. Um, one thing I've begun to notice is, um, for example, a lot, a lot of lab results are coming back after the patient is discharged, and what are the implications of that? So that we have this data available, and what I'm saying is we should use it. So just to summarize, as an industrial engineer, these are some of the areas where I think we can have a large impact on healthcare delivery, and I just wanted to bring them up, and I'd be happy to answer your questions about them during the panel. Um, one area that I'm really interested in but haven't done a lot of work in is um, looking at care coordination for chronic care patients. So again, we have this information of what they need, um, when we expect them to use it, and can we better coordinate our services, again, to reduce cost and um, things like that. I'm interested in divert, avoiding divert. What types of policies can we put in place to avoid 
divert situations, um, surge capacity, medical errors. Also, as, a, as an industrial engineer, I'm very interested in identifying performance measurements for a hospital system. Um, we do it in manufacturing. We know how our lines are running. Why can't we do that in a hospital? Um, another area where industrial engineers do quite a bit of work is in facilities planning and layout and design. And could we bring some of those tools and technologies to a hospital or healthcare or an outpatient setting? Um, I'm also interested in scheduling, optimal scheduling. And a big area which um, I don't think a lot of people actually think about is inventory management, keeping track of that inventory, when to order it, and again, that's very costly. So to summarize, I think industrial engineers do have a lot to offer for healthcare delivery, and um, I hope to see more of them in the hospitals. So thank you. Okay. Hi. Uh, first of all, I'm really glad to be back here. I really enjoyed visiting both San Francisco and Berkeley. It's, it's really great. What I want to talk with you about today is something called pervasive healthcare. And I'll start actually by showing you this slide here. Because uh, one of the first thing, things you notice when you, when you work with healthcare is that it's, it's actually really different from office work or work in the office. The first thing, thing you'll notice is that it's really collaborative. If you need to do anything within healthcare, you need to have multi-professions involved and you need to really collaborate uh, close with these people. The second, th second thing you notice is that it's, it's physical. You actually need to smell, you need to grab, you need to hold, you need to kind of use your body, use your senses uh, doing the work. So it's not, not enough just sitting behind, behind your desk working. You really need to use your body. Then it's also really mobile. We, we put a step counter on a, on a nurse and found out that during a normal work shift, she was running between seven and 10 miles during, during one normal work shift. So that, that might be another way of kind of improving the health of America. <laughs> <laughs> Turning them into nurses. A, a, a final, final aspect is that it's highly volatile. So even though you might have a booking system to plan all these things, uh, in reality, the plans are changed all the time and you have to adapt to these things. But again, if you look at the, some of the t technology that is introduced into hospitals, and especially with the electronic me medical record and patient record, what you do is you make small offices within the hospital. That is, you take the corner of the operating room, you put in a table, you put in a keyboard, a mouse, a, a computer screen for, for watching PAX images and lab results and stuff like that. You take the nurse's office and put in computer with the desktop, uh, keyboards and mouses and stuff like that. And uh, one, of, one of our, our claims is that th this technology has been developed for an office environment and it's actually not fitting being mobile, having to use your physical body and, and, and really have to work with the patients. Um, so what we have worked with is the question of, about can we use a novel invention within in technology to, to provide better systems that are, provide a better match to some of the, the challenges within healthcare. So that is looking at novel interaction techniques and novel uses of sensors and, and novel paradigms for using, using technology within hospitals. So I've, I've summarized three main movements. Uh, many of them have been covered during the conference. So the first one we'll see is home care. We'll see that more and more uh, people are being treated at home um, and we'll see more and more chronic ill patients being treated at home. The second, second thing is that we haven't talked that much about it during this conference is that I think we'll see a lot more complex services within hospitals because if we're sending kind of the, the normal patient home, what's left in the hospitals are the severe ill pa uh, patients and it's the acute patients. Another kind of movement, especially in Denmark, is that we are, we are getting larger and larger units because the, the treatments are going to be more and more complex. So we need to kind of collect these complex treatments in, in larger units, larger hospitals. So that means we, we have much more complex services. And the third point I want to, to make is that we, we need new ways of developing uh, systems for healthcare because to match this size in, uh, in complexity, we really need some tools where, where we're able to, 
to iteratively involve the users and patients uh, during the process. Uh, one of the thing, things we've noticed uh, during our work is if you ask doctors, nurses, patients what they want, they're often wrong. They don't know what they actually want. So if you ask them what they want and you, based on that, makes a requirement specification, it's often misguiding. They'll be disappointed when you deliver the system based on this, uh, this uh, requirement specification. And one of the, one of the thing, things we, we think we'll see in the future is a lot more iterative development, a lot more involvement of, of users. Uh, I'll briefly run through some of the projects I've been involved with within these areas. So the first one about home care. Uh, when I visited, visited Berkeley, we were looking at fall detection. How can you actually detect a fall uh, based on different things? We had some sensors. We took them out to an elderly home in Sonoma, tried it out and stuff like that, and we found out that it's, it's actually not that easy, and there's a lot of situation. I was following an, an elderly lady around, and suddenly the phone was ringing, and she had a walker, so she was going pretty much like this to catch, catch the, the phone. And it's pretty much resembled kind of falling down the stairs or something like that. But, but again, it was, was a really interesting project, and I've, I've talked to some people that think, think that the fall detection is just kind of the first step. Uh, so if you can make a segue that is able kind of to keep the balance, can you actually kind of combine the sensor values to kind of your balance and actually counter-steer if someone is, is about to fall? So, so this is one project within, within the home care I've been working with. Then currently we are, we're working on a project with pregnant women with diabetes, because if you have diabetes, there's a huge risk of a miscarriage. So you really have to monitor your diabetes very carefully while being pregnant, and we've, we've been working with that. Then we've worked uh, together with IBM Denmark with a project about elderly, where they were supposed to take the medicine, prompt about when to take the medicine, measure blood pressure, me measure the weight, and stuff like that. And it was in, installed in a number of uh, elderly homes, uh, it was based on tablet PC that would prompt them when they had to take the medicine. And one of the thing, things you realize when you, you get out, out in the wild is that sometimes this kind of tablet PC might be nice in the lab, but in an elderly home it's, it's kind of not, not that nice. So, so the, uh, this, uh, the wife of this man kind of put a flower pot on top of the tablet PC to kind of make it to fit into this elderly home, which of course resulted in that this, uh, this tablet PC went into a sleep mode and weren't able to kind of give the alarms. So again, again, it's, it's not to say that this was a bad example. We saw a lot of thing, things and these, some of these elderly really got a better feeling of, of their own health, the relationship between the blood pressure and, and how they felt. But again, there's a lot of details you really have to pay attention to. Within services, within hospitals, I've been involved in a number of projects there. One of them we called active theater, and one of the thing, thing we looked at there was, can you actually dictate the medical record while you're performing surgery? So if you're having a surgery for 14 hours or something like that, instead of having to dictate the record after the surgery, can, you, can we use voice recognition and, uh, and voice commands to capture video and pictures. So if you have removed something, you can say I've removed uh, a piece of, of, of meat with cancer in and all, all the edges are okay and stuff like that and the weight is such and such. We also worked with, uh, with large uh, displays with zoomable interfaces. So instead of this doctor having to move away from the patient, he could actually control, control the information from, from uh, the place where he, he, he stood. A similar project we, we have in the hospitals, um, it's called the Citrea Surgical, it's a commercial project right now, and it's about scheduling, because there's a lot of great booking system out there for scheduling uh, operations, uh, but the problem is that within the first hour from 7 to 8 in the morning, something like that, the, the program is completely changed. They have kind of uh, emergency uh, acute patient coming in, there's a, a woman going to labor that is coming down, there is a doctor that turn, turn, turns out to be sick and so, stuff like that. So you constantly have to, to reorganize the program and we've worked with the, with the different new technologies within this project. So first of all, we, we worked with large interactive displays. One of, one of the doctors we worked with said, if you're going to make me an IT system where I have to click once with the mouse, it's it's one time too many. I don't want to click anymore. I'm clicking too much already. So make me a system where I don't have to click. So we, we work with different visualization techniques to, to uh, pro, uh, provide an, an overview without actually having to, to click to get this information. 
we worked with uh, video streaming from the operating rooms, not to kind of do telemedicine, but to provide awareness information about what is going on in these operating rooms. We used chat, chat that was actually really efficient uh, between operating rooms and uh, the, the patient wards and other, other stuff, because a lot of, lot of the phone calls weren't really necessary or acute or something. Can you take another patient at the end of the day? And Chad actually provided a really, really good uh, method for, for doing this kind of communication. We, we worked, of course, with mobile access to the data. We tracked the, the clinician so you could see where the doctors were and what, uh, uh, what they were doing. And then we extended the communication infrastructure. So of course you had the phone to call the people if it was kind of really, really acute but again, if you needed to, to chat with a person, then you could do it and you could kind of see what was going on in the different operating rooms through the video and, and through, through the, the program. Um, and then again, we started out actually wanting to build a system for the operating ward, but what it turned out to be was everyone in the hospitals were interested in, in these kind of informations, and especially a department like the central sterile department actually really needed this information because they were the one actually preparing all the equipment, and for them it was really necessary to, to, to know as soon as, as someone changed the schedule that they had to adapt to these changes. And, and they also felt that kind of being in the loop made, made them kind of part of a hospital uh, instead of being somewhere in the basement somewhere. So, so this system is currently running uh, in 14 operating rooms in the hospitals in, in Denmark. Then the third, third thing I want to point out is uh, we really need to do, have design methods where we involve the, the end user, and it's the doctors, it's the nurses, and it's, uh, and, uh, and it's um, the patients. Because again, especially if, if we work for Facebook, then we are pretty much the users we're designing for. But when we work for healthcare, we, we're designing for someone we don't even know how they live none of the designers of technology are, are above 80 years old or something like that or know what it's like to, to handle their medicine and, and having to take all these pills or, or being, being in a hospital. So we really need to, to kind of, as soon as we have a new idea, get, it, get, get some feedback from, from, from the users and also work in, in multidisciplinary teams because we can really learn a lot from, from game designers, industrial designers like, like we just uh, saw or anthropologists or, or other people. And it's, it's also really challenging to work with them. And just to, to uh, put, uh, make a point, if you, if you look at the hearing aids, they're really stigmatizing and they're trying to make them kind of as discreet as possible. But if you look at the top, if you are having kind of two wires hanging out your ear, then you're suddenly cool, then you're suddenly kind of a fashion statement. So again, just trying to, to grasp these kind of different, different stuff. And, and even though you're elderly, you're still pretty aware about how you look. And you don't want to run around, around with a big button saying, hey, I'm, I'm in the danger of falling all the time, so I have to run around with this big red button so I can press it. So you, you really need to, to pay attention to the people you're designing for and really need some people who are good at, at understanding what these people, people need. So just to, to summarize it, um, some, of the, some of the trends I see, see within healthcare, or at least I've selected for this talk, is home care. And I think what we'll see is sensors and actuators. We'll see them body, bodily implanted and we'll see them in, in the environment. But we have to be really careful about how we're doing it. Because I don't want to live in a, in a home where everyone else knows what is going on beside myself. I really, you really need to, to be aware of, about privacy and, and these issues. Then I think we'll see a lot of specialized service robots. I don't think we'll, we'll kind of see the Android robots, but I think we'll see a lot of robots like the, the, the Roomba for, for cleaning the toilets, cleaning the floors, maybe helping the patient take a, take a shower, moving them around in the middle of the night and stuff like that. I think we'll see some, some specialized service robots. Complex service in hospitals. What I'm working on is redesigning computing to match uh, some of these requirements I mentioned in the beginning within healthcare. We'll see more patients being treated remotely, and that also means that we have to, to design sign hospitals in another way if half of our patients are not actually physical there, but somewhere else. Then uh, we'll see more acute and severe ill patients. And then we need to involve the patient and clinicians in development. And finally, some of the other trends we have seen here is 
we need standards for exchanging information between systems, and there's a lot, lot of uh, gain within biology, nanotechnology, gene therapy, and, and these area. But that's that's not my main main area. And if you want to know more about the project, there's research papers about all of them. So thank you very much. Um, the <clears throat> part of Thomas's presentation that was just on the design um, is a perfect segue for where I hope to take you for the next 10 minutes. Um, I, I think that the next big set of innovations in healthcare are not necessarily the technologies or the spaces or the tools that we put in place for our clinicians and our patients, um, but the actual infrastructure of design and innovation that we're embedding in our organizations to have ongoing innovation and design happening all the time rather than just project-based. And we're starting to see that in lots of healthcare organizations. We're starting to see different organizations building the bits and pieces of a good design structure so that this can happen. So over the next 10 minutes, I'm going to talk a little bit about Kaiser's um, design thinking of what, what we mean by that, and then a brief case study of how we've applied that. Um, so when I say design thinking, there's um, lots of definitions out there, but it really is taking the methodologies of design and really thinking about how can we create structures and tools and processes and the roles that support them that are really human-centered. So a lot of folks talk about patient-centered, and human-centered for us in the healthcare world is optimizing that relationship between our patients and our clinicians. We don't want to design systems and spaces and tools that are hard for our clinicians to use, but all patient-centric. We want to make sure they're optimizing that time and space between our patients and uh, the clinicians. So for Kaiser, uh, we are tapping into these four areas for design thinking. And specifically, we have our innovation consultancy, which I'm a member of. And we fi started five years ago, and we partnered with IDO uh, for a year and a half early on. And the purpose was to really embed the theories and methods of design thinking into Kaiser. So take those methodologies, learn them well, and be able to apply them over and over again. So that started five years ago. And um, we are now we're adding a few more members, growing our team. We're slowly building, getting this uh, methodology uh, part of us. The methodology itself is pretty standard. Um, this is um, a fusion of what we learned from IDO as well as from Institute for Healthcare Improvement. Now, IDO gave us the art of innovation, but you need more than an art form at Kaiser Permanente. We are an evidence-based organization. So what the Institute for Healthcare Improvement gave us was the science of measurement. So we kind of mashed those up together into our own methodology. So not only are we pr uh, producing good design, but we're also creating the evidence that compel people to want to make the changes that we're recommending. The third piece of our, um, of our strategy is around space. So we have our Garfield Center, which is out by Oakland Airport. <clears throat> it's a 37,000 square foot uh, warehouse, and inside we have a fake hospital and a fake outpatient clinic and a fake home. And my favorite spot is this big open area with nothing in it where you can prototype uh, and let your imagination go wild. This is a place where we're really allowed to think outside the box, try new technologies, try new space configurations, try new workflows, but most importantly, see how all these bits and pieces fit together before we bring them into a live environment or build them or invest in them and so on and so on. And the fourth piece is around networks. Um, at Kaiser and I think many other health organizations we become, become, become very myoptic and really constantly look internally for our solutions. The Innovation Learning Network um, is a group of really wonderful healthcare organizations, um, Ascension, a CHI, Partners out of Boston, Indian Health Service, Kaiser Permanente, where we, we created this network a few years ago to connect innovators and senior executives that are thinking about innovation to help each other learn the techniques and push each other's prototypes and innovations forward. So if I have a design challenge, uh, traditionally I might look just inside of Kaiser Permanente, but now I have a whole host of innovators in healthcare who I can bounce my prototypes off of and who help guide me and push me forward. So an example of all these pieces come together. Um, last year we tackled uh, medication administration, which 
the whole world was having problems with, as well as Kaiser Permanente. And um, in our techniques, we look at both uh, quantitative and qualitative um, data. So we're trying to understand what the big issues are, and we're also trying to understand where the pain points and where the joy currently is. So yes, we have the numbers to say that there are a problem, but how do you compel people to get involved, and how do you really understand the pain points? Well, we create these inter interdisciplinary teams of nurses and doctors and patients, and we do something like draw your experience. So you can see two pictures uh, at the corner here, two different nurses from two different hospitals. We said, draw your experience of medication administration. And remarkably, we have lots of pictures that look like this, nurses with frazzled hair, all sticking up on end. Now, if you ask those nurses, what's the problem with medication administration? They would say, we don't have any problem. I mean, we have to work hard, we're running back and forth, and it's crazy, but you know, it's just the way it is. But you ask them to think a little bit differently by asking them to draw, or paint, or whatever your technique is, and different expressions can come out. And clearly, um, these folks said there wasn't really that big of a problem, but the frazzled hair said something to us. And what we learned is that the, the process really is chaotic, uh, full of interruptions, it's unclear, not standardized, all sorts of problems that create a very highly unreliable system. So um, we brought uh, 70 nurses, doctors, patients, experts from across the country together at the Garfield Center for two days where we presented these stories, we sent them off to do analogous research, so we sent them to flight school, we sent them to Safeway, we sent them to um, the Lexus dealership, we sent them to a forensic scientist here at UC Berkeley, um, brought them off for a couple hours, they went and explored these different areas, they came back again to the Garfield Center, and for the next uh, day and a half, they tried to tackle different bits and pieces of the medication administration challenge, and through very focused brainstorming. And they came up with over 400 ideas that would make this a better process. Then they took those 400 ideas, picked their favorite ones, the things they had passion over, and they prototyped them in two hours. So the stuff they had available to them, arts and crafts materials, cardboard boxes, they built for us what they thought the future would look like for them. And then they acted it out. So here you see a scene at the Garfield Center, again in my favorite spot, which is the empty space. And they quickly mocked up a patient's room and they are showing a demonstration of what a good medication administration would be in the future. And through these, all these experiences, we're asking, we're trying to temporarily turn our patients and our clinicians into designers to partner with us so that these are their designs that we're co-developing with them. Here's a, uh, an example of one of the ideas that started in April 07 at the Deep Dive, a very basic example. Um, what I love about this is be, it's tangible. Most of what we do is intangible, is process design, um, but that's hard to show on a slide. But here is a great example of a tangible one. The nurse came up with this idea of wearing a vest that would stop everybody from interrupting her during a medication pass. And there's a whole bunch of other things that went along with it. But it was a pretty good idea. So we asked a nurse to try it for one unit in one shift a month later, and we bought a construction vest at the Home Depot. And what we found out is that conceptually, the nurses loved it. They felt protected. They felt like they could really focus in on medications, but they hated the vest. They thought it looked like construction workers. So we said, well, what will make that better for you? And so they suggested a sash. So we tried a sash that was in Hayward in, in June of 07. And this young lady said she felt safer, she felt more comfortable and confident, but she felt like she was going to church. And we said, well, how can we fix that? And she said, well, try to make it a little sleeker and sexier. And so we came up with red vinyl, which is in Hayward uh, just a month later. We thought that was sexy. And indeed, nurses were feeling better and better about what we were producing. And just a month, a couple months later, we ended up with the final design, uh, which is that glowy, uh, reflective material, which is now called uh, no interruption wear. Just, I think, a really nice, simple example of a con concept that co probably could have failed early on if we went with what the outcome was rather than the concept. So this is conceptually a fail, a fail, a fail, a fail, but every failure, conceptually, we succeeded. And in the end, we came up with a great design. This happens to be a part of an innovation we call KP MedWrite, which is made up of three pieces that came out of this. So again, we started with 400 fabulous, crazy, terrible ideas, and we whittled it down, whittled it down over um, the summer, and came up with three pieces. The foundation is the process. So the new behaviors that are human-centered create a much safer, warmer medication experience for the patient and the clinician. 
Um, the no interruption wear, which is that yellow sash to kind of support the process, and a sacred zone in front of um, Pixis machines or where they pull medications. Again, just another reminder of being safe uh, during this experience. What we found um, is that baseline, um, we were only achieving about a third reliability for a good medication pass. And the definition of reliability is up there. I'm not going to go into that. But what we were able to achieve just one month later was um, going from a third to about 75% reliable, and two months later hitting around 80%. And now we're up to, 80, uh, up to over 90% reliable. And the reliability is a common definition um, across the industry. So we are way, way better off than we were prior to this um, uh, initiative. And we now have this uh, pilot, which was in just two hospitals and two units, now in um, all hospitals at Kaiser Permanente, um, except for our Southern California region, which is 11 hospitals. They're kicking off at the end of this year. So next year, we should have all of our hospitals up and running on a standard, human-centered way of doing medication administration. There are also some really futuristic ideas that come out of our work. So if this is the stuff that we can, if this is the stuff that we can do now, um, they also do think of some really great stuff that is just kind of out there and we're not able to pull off just in a few months. So this was an idea about a medication room of the future. They have some really great ideas, um, task-based lighting. We know that our nurses are getting older and they're having a harder time reading the medication bottles and the pills. And so their concept is that in medication rooms, as they approach the different medication areas, they'll get extra illumination that not only illuminates, um, it reminds them where they belong, gives them the, uh, the illumination to read better, but when they move out of that area, it then shuts itself off and the next task area lights up, so it brings them through a natural workflow through the medication room. Uh, pretty unique concept. Um, some of these ideas, although futuristic, and we do mock them up, that picture doesn't really do it justice of what it looks like mocked up, um, are starting to leak their way into our national facilities. So we're not always sure what we're going to do with these futuristic ideas, but just by prototyping them and putting them up once, it does start influencing um, what the future could look like and feel like. So here is a, just a one-page case study summary of what I just went over. Um, the orange is the infrastructure of innovation and design, and that's what I think really is key for everything I've just shared with you. And again, we're seeing lots of organizations starting to put these bits and pieces in place. So along the top is a timeline, starting with observations. I told you about um, drawing pictures and, and visiting with our patients and clinicians, all the way to the very end of implementation. So the orange bar is our group, the Innovation Consultancy, administering the innovation method of design. And the little circles are the Innovation Learning Network, so that network of innovators across the United States. Four, uh, four, five times they influenced our design. Early on, we had um, two-hour sensing sessions. So the Veterans Administration, um, uh, Ascension Healthcare, and partners all did two hours the best and worst of medication administration. All four of our organizations jump-started each other's innovation work because of that section, uh, the, those sessions. They then joined us during our deep dive at the Garfield Center. So although it was mostly Kaiser, um, we had several members from the ILN come and participate in our designs and help influencing our thinking. And then, of course, the infrastructure of the Garfield Center itself, a place to innovate and bring people together um, to do better, good, human-centered design. So that's all I got. I hope that you think that design thinking is something you should explore. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I don't know whether you came out with a lot of questions and ideas or things that you want to probe with um, the panelists, but I certainly did. Um, and I'd like to take it um, initially, some of my probes with them, um, from some of those, remember I said at the beginning, when there is a void, it gives you an opportunity for innovators or some other person to put something in it. And the, we've now seen some opportunities where people have put something in it. And some of the big voids that were implied in this were that being able to predict and prevent decline in patients in the ICU is actually part of 
in a sense, um, the model that um, Stuart is working on a little bit. The, um, the issues of social justice um, and being able to provide health care in areas where it doesn't currently exist, part of what Eric was exploring. Renata, that we know we have um, this booming crisis of too many patients and too few health care workers. How can we start to create design and work processes and what tools do we need to, to really manage to some of those issues? Thomas, um, talking about, um, I don't know whether you were in healthcare or observed healthcare during the 1970s and 80s, but we really had an opportunity to see the baby boomers. Baby boomers as a group influenced huge portions of the way we delivered obstetric care, and we are now seeing them move into geriatric care. Consumerism and really managing to some of those expectations patients have of not being branded um, handicapped by the, the hearing aid that you have to wear or the cell phone that you have to use that has bigger buttons because your hands can't quite manage those teeny little buttons. Um, and, and Chris, in, in the nature of kind of taking design and really starting to integrate it into the way we create processes, how we network ourselves to, to jumpstart learning and all those kinds of things. So, um, so panel, um, Stuart, for example, um, are you starting to look at kind of some of the, the powerful information that will come out of your system to be able to predict and prevent decline for patients? And I love the example he used. Um, I, I'm a NICU nurse by former trade, um, former life, and so I recognized the patient right away. I recognized the three chest tubes that the patient had because of the pneumovax that were sitting in the front. But 50% of that equipment, I didn't recognize. That was, ter I, that was terrifying to me. <laughs> so there's lots of new equipment and new, new inputs that are coming into uh, to patients. So, uh, Yeah, so detecting the conditions that need to be treated, uh, detecting them early, is, is really what this is all about. So the stuff that we've actually succeeded in doing so far is really more around the periphery, but the... The main goals are detecting things like cerebral edema, um, on early onset of organ failure, early onset of lung injury, early onset of infection. So, um, uh, you know, we we think, and my, my collaborator believes, you know, when he if he sits there for 72 hours, watching the patient and watching the monitor, he believes he can make much better treatment decisions than if he just meets with the nurses for five minutes every morning, which is the way it happens right now. Um, so I also want to point out that, that the intensive care unit is just, is just one example, right? You could, you could take these same ideas and you could transfer them to chronic care where you're, you're actually following patients over months or years and they're in the home, uh, for example, or they're, they're having occasional hospital visits. It's the ability to integrate data over time uh, is really crucial to understanding what's happening with a person. Uh, so that's, that's one of the main things that we're trying to do. And that jumps me over to Renata because one of the things is that 80% of care is actually delivered outside the hospital. So actually, how do you start to see some of your work start to translate into some of that out-of-hospital process? Um, well, one thing, I've actually started to work with the VA and have these conversations with them because they have this data about the continuity of care and again can we look at where care is administered, when it's administered and what is needed and kind of take this predictive type of modeling onto outside of the hospital. So yeah, so we're starting to look at that. We had a question out in the audience. And do you um, give the, um, the ladies that are passing the microphone an opportunity because I think you're recording, are you, Ravi? So you, they want to capture all the comments. Uh, my, my question is actually, uh, I, it, it's a theme that I noticed among all your works, um, is that there's a, you start with sort of raw data and you make sense of it in the hopes that it could be interpreted and used in a different way. Uh, and to a large degree, even with your work, Renata, it, it's, it's synthesis and, and presentation at a level above which people actually have it. And Stuart, I think, uses a perfect example of that. I, I'm wondering, um, 
of the implication of this and what you think of this, uh, clearly there's, there's many PhD theses here on this topic, but there is this issue of, of cognitive overload in places like ICU units and hospitals and healthcare in general, where there's a tremendous amount of information that's essentially assaulted, assaulting the people who work in those environments. Um, and I realize that in many of these efforts, you're reducing the signal to noise ratio, or sorry, increasing the signal to noise ratio, but there's still a signal that needs to be paid attention to. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And is it ever possible to sort of get away from that uh, to some degree where it's a little bit more pleasant place uh, to work? Or are we t eventually working toward a place where the intelligence is sort of moving up layers uh, from the actual raw data? And are there implications for propagating error that way? I think so look, look, let me take that in two parts. So first of all, the overload is, is, is there in spades. I mean, if you know, you've all seen pictures like Apollo 13, you know, mission control. There's like 50 guys with steel rim glasses and short sleeve shirts sitting there uh, looking at all the telemetry data from one rocket. Now that rocket is far simpler than the human body and yet needs 50 guys to look at the data that's being generated from this rocket. Uh, whereas, you know, they have one nurse looking at five patients uh, with all of this, you know, and each patient has a dozen, 15 screens uh, churning out data all the time. So the overload is ridiculous. Um, and so what happens is all the data is ignored, by and large. Um, so certainly you would like it to be the case that the data is actually processed more intelligently um, and summarized and made available in a form that uh, a human being could actually make sense of and, and act on in a reasonable Time frame. So part of the problem is just the business model. Nobody wants to feed their data to any kind of common uh, display uh, surface. Instead, they have their own proprietary dis uh, data formats, their own proprietary displays, uh, because they, they imagine fondly that somehow they're going to get a monopoly of the whole ICU if they keep this up. Uh, it seems insane to me. Um, so it really would make sense that there be one display and that um, techniques of, of intelligent user interface design be applied so that the stuff that's on the display is what needs to be on there and that will vary according to the circumstance uh, and it's easy for the nurse to, to drill down into the data to look at past data and so on. These, these are not, this is not rocket science if, to uh, repeat the metaphor from before. Uh, I, think, I think again uh, from a design perspective it's pretty easy to design a complex system but designing a simple system that kind of is complex is one of the hardest design challenges at all. So if, if the user say hey this looks simple even though it has a lot of functionality uh, underneath it it's, it's really a brilliant design whereas if you have these kind of systems with a lot of buttons and all the feature, feature lists and stuff like that then you're probably not at, at the final stage of your design. So, so this, creating a complex, simple design is, is one of the biggest challenges at all, also for healthcare. We have a question over here. I work for a, a sm relatively small uh, healthcare system, two hospitals. Um, different workflows in, in the different hospitals um, and every time we uh, start talking about trying to take the time necessary to build models of workflow processes uh, to, try to, uh, to try to improve these things, um, what we find out is it takes an incredible amount of time of our nurses, our nurse managers, our physicians, physician managers, and it really acts as a kind of in impediment to, to building those models. Um, the ICU discussion and the, um, the use of HL7 to make predictive uh, uh, forecasts about the consumption of resources in the hospital, uh, is this something that, that is going to require a lot of uh, uh, engineering input up front? Or is it something to build these models? Or is this something that is going to happen in a kind of an automated fashion so that uh, suggestions about workflow improvements will fall out of effectively the data gathering uh, process. Okay, I'll, I'll start. Um, ideally, we'd like to make it as automated as possible. And to address your point about the, the work of nurses doing up front and and 
and industrial engineers are trained to do that, to go into a system and look at it and sort of have the tools. And I actually taught a, a systems engineering class for nurses this past summer. And one of the nurses told me, she said, I'm expected to do this thing, but I don't have all these things, but I don't have the tools. And that's where I think an engineer as kind of a, an observer can come in and look at a system and, and analyze and quantize and model it. So that's what I think we can bring. And what we hope to do is, is have an automated way to generate these types of predictive systems because you don't want to spend days and days sitting there with someone and talking about it. And I think that's kind of the beauty of, of mining the data that exists and is out there is because that's specific to your institution because that's the data from your institution. And I think one of the large um, issues in, in modeling and in simulation and queuing and all these things you hear is um, a lot of these models are not transferable because they were built for built with a lot of, they require a lot of data, a lot of input from a, one location, and then it's very difficult to transfer it to another. So that's why our idea is, is using these HL7 messages and coming up with a way to automatically create these models would solve some of this uh, work, additional workload on the nurses and clinicians. So, I don't know. Stuart, so, I, so for these models that we're using of human physiology, they are um, in some sense completely generic. So we're, we're building a model of human physiology and, and as long as you've got humans in the ICU, um, there shouldn't be a requirement to, um, to tailor it by hand for the particular patient circumstance. It is true that every patient is different and the models have this built-in uh, learning mechanism that will automatically estimate the parameters of the particular patient. So let's take something like blood volume. So that's part of the cardiovascular model, but there's no straightforward direct measure of blood volume available in the ICU. Um, but the model can actually estimate that parameter from looking at the way the whole system is behaving. Uh, it can configure it out for that particular patient. So the models adapt themselves to the, uh, to the patient by looking at the data that's coming from the patient. And the only extra work that you need to do, and if you did this in a new hospital, would be if the, if the hospital is using a new kind of sensor that was different from the ones that, w that were described um, elsewhere, then you would need uh, to build a model that characterizes that sensor. Uh, but that's, you know, the, basically you would do that for at the manufacturer level, not necessarily at the individual hospital level. I'd like to add Question. something. Can I add something? Yes, please. Um, sure. So um, you also mentioned that uh, it's just a lot of work to perhaps do process engineering or mapping and understanding the full workflow, and I, I fully agree with that. Um, the, the, on a very practical level, um, it, it's at, and this might be blasphemy for some people, <laughs> um, it's less important to understand the very nature of your as-is model as it is to um, inspire and design for where you want to be. And so, for example, um, you know, Kaiser, we have four hospital regions, we have 33 hospitals, and they are different, but they're also similar enough to design together. And so um, we're not interested in understanding every nuance of every workflow in every unit. However, we design together to understand where the workflows should be as a system, and then how do we move each of those individual units to, to that new standard, which we call a minimum set of specifications. So we're not trying to standardize, we're actually trying to create a minimum standard that people can at least meet and hopefully, hopefully we inspire them to continue innovating and designing to make it even better. So um, there's a way of getting around, I used to do process engineering and there's, it's very intensive, um, but there's a way to get around it and we do that from a human-centered perspective and it, and going into the, the near present and the far future and designing for that, rather than trying to understand all the mechanics of what's happening right now. So. We had a question over here. Yeah. Uh, some of you addressed it already, but could you comment a bit on how big a challenge it is to make users trust the technology uh, before you start using a model for overbooking or a technology for emergency care? Is it trivial or big, and how do you overcome it? Trusting the technology. At least the, one of the experiences we have had is that if, for instance, you want to introduce something to doctors and nurses and stuff like that, involving them really early in the design process is a good way 
of giving them the feeling that this is not a product that a company is coming and trying to force them to use, but it's actually their own products they have developed through a number of workshops. So at least one, one answer would be to involve the user early on. So, so when you introduce a new device in a hospital setting, it's not something completely unfamiliar, but something they felt that we actually built this, uh, this system. Chris, how does that then translate into innovative processes? Because I, I think regularly it's, you know, the kind of not invented here syndrome. Yep. And yeah, um, same. We uh, in, invite users every step of the way. In fact, the users are the ones who are the developers. We're, we're temporarily turning them into designers. And so by, you know, marrying West Los Angeles with Hayward um, for several months, um, we can avoid the not in my backyard or not invented here syndrome. Um, the other piece with processes um, that are a little bit more tricky than uh, designing a tool or a technology is that a process or a service um, is mostly a behavior. And so to make these behaviors stick or these services be replicated over and over again, you also have to embed sustainability pieces into that. And so the way we do that is through uh, metrics. And metrics aren't meant just for observation, they're meant for action. So when we deliver an innovative service, we marry that with a set of sustainability concepts and ideas that go along with it. So a lot of people don't like the whole Hawthorne effect where you toss something out there and then you're not, you know, you're just affecting the system. Well, we try to capitalize on that. Great. How can we use that to our advantage? So our innovations are not just the behavior or just the cup or the technology. It's sustainability ideas that go along with it. And sustainability is forever. You have to keep doing it over and over again. That's why Big Macs taste good 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago. It's consistent. Eric, let's take that then to the Congo, though. Sure. Because, um, you know, with somebody there to support the kind of change process or the technology or the user, you know, you may not have that. So that kind of has to be reliable, has to function the way it does, is, is kind of, has maybe a different threshold in the... Yeah, yeah, I, th I think that's absolutely true. I mean, it's, you know, in, in the course of our, our project, we're having to build in a lot of field testing, build in a lot of input from the users so that, you know, what what we might design in our lab in Berkeley might not work at all in, in the conditions that, that we would take over there. You know, considerations of power consumption or you know, power not being reliable or, you know, reagents not being able to be stored properly or, you know, sh shipping times, all these things that, that we would really take for granted. So, yeah, I mean, we, I think we're going to have to have a, a much more sort of field-heavy and iterative design process than, than we would have here. I, um, I was at the American Telemedicine Association meeting um, yesterday and the day before, and Lord Swenfen, who has a large foundation for funding um, tech, um, uh, connections between healthcare providers in third world countries and um, industrialized nations, um, connect to be able to, to give consults. There was a picture where somebody was taking a cell phone picture of an x-ray that they could then transmit to a to an expert in the in the United Kingdom, and so what other you know given that cell phone is really the is seeming to be the pervasive platform, what other kind of um, innovations do you see kind of moving to the cell phone other than microscopy and, and mm -hmm. some things? Well, you know, I, I think I think uh, I've, I've I've seen some other people talk about you know using. Using the cell phone to be able to do, you know, tracking tracking patients over time, doing the data entry in a in a way that, you know, like that people are already familiar with with using this technology, even if they're not comfortable with a lot of others, and so, you know, being able to to have this, you know, sort of ready-made electronic uh, patient record um, could be could be an easy application of of the cell phone technology. I mean. A uh, short comment uh, before, and it's, it's just again, if you deploy technology and you want to deploy it in the homes of people, you really need to think about how to support it from the first, first moment on, because yeah. you just can't imagine how many things that can go wrong, even with simple technology, not being able to get a connection, not being able to, to do all these things, and especially with elderly, 
there's a lot of th things uh, to, do, to, to do to get the system working, so you really need to, to think about, about support from the first moment on you design technology for the homes. Yeah, the picture you showed of the, you mm, know, the flowers exactly, on top exactly. of that, you know, have you created that notebook so it takes water and <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> cold and things like that? There's a question over so, here. Yeah, hi, uh, this is a question to Chris, also to the panel as well. So you presented uh, sort of the design for quality kind of methodology. I mean, you use different words, and so you know, I'm, I'm familiar with that whole area. Of, one of the things, actually, I think that needs work is, I think in your work you showed design for nurses sort of satisfaction in some sense. But what about design for the patient? Because there's this whole uh, philosophy of design for the consumer, mm -hmm. or design for the patient, as the patient care is moving from the hospital to the homes yeah. and outside. Not many people have looked at the design at much more depth at the patient level. Sure. That, um, that means instead of having a, a bunch of physicians and nurses in your laboratory, let's say get patients inside and let them do the design of the insides of the hospital yep. and the outside of the hospital. Is that being looked at? But that's uh, something that's more fascinating and it's hard to capture. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and that's something that I think would, would open up new ideas. Sure. At the uh, same time, in terms of information being shown to them and, you know, whatever. Those yeah. kind of things. A absolutely. Um, this was just one example. We, this was mostly a nursing-focused example, um, but we have uh, patients and doctors and nurses on our design team. In fact, our, past pro our project that we're currently working on right now is transitions from the hospital to the home, and our team, um, along with a couple other folks, have uh, spent, uh, I think, over 100 hours in our patients' homes observing and interviewing them and really trying to understand um, the clinicians have a very specific view of what they think clinically is happening, but when you get into someone's home and watch them navigate their medication bottles um, at 4 o'clock in the morning, you get a very, very different perspective. And then those same people who are creating all these workarounds to understand and use their medications in their home, we invite them to be a part of the design process and help us better create systems that will fit into their home lives. Um, we do think that's where care is going, is into the home, so we're spending more and more time in people's homes. Yeah, a absolutely, absolutely. So well, it, it, depends, it depends on the design challenge we're working on. Um, so right now we're deeply in people's homes. Um, last year we were deeply in the hospital. It just depends on where we're at. We also tried to, to, to do a workshop in the waiting area in the hospital where we, we asked the, the patient they could wait in kind of a, a non-workshop waiting area or they could kind of join our workshop where we've kind of completely transformed the waiting area. We had provided food and kind of a cozy atmosphere and stuff like that and, and used this to have a, a, have an, a workshop with the patients and, and hearing their view both before entering a consultation and coming, coming back again. So, so I think there's a lot, a lot of thing, things to do to involve the patient in, in all these different kind of areas. And I think another key point about patients are that, especially with chronic patients, they are experts too. If you, have a, if you have a diabetes doctor, this doctor might have kind of the clinical expertise, but the patient has kind of the everyday expertise of how to manage the diabetes 24-7. And this kind of expertise you really need to, to bring into, into the loop as well. But I, I think another aspect of that moving care to the home is not just the single patient that's managing their disease, um, but also the extended caregivers in the yes. family. And so to count them in on part of that design really becomes important. I was part of a design group with um, Chris's group looking at private room NICUs and you know where the family you know the patient um, that um, Stuart showed us so well that little teeny infant in that crib in that huge room in the in, with all the equipment around it well the family's behind one of those pieces of equipment um, and so so their experience and their ability to adjunct care especially as we're moving into this decreased um, volume of caregivers and increased volume of, of care needy, needers Ravi, and then a question over here, and then a question in back. Um, just like the first. Okay, so you first, then Ravi, then back. We'll just make Sorry. a swoop this Sorry, way guys. then. <laughs> no, um, there's so many opportunities to innovate in healthcare, and I'm just wondering, especially um, with Chris, 
being with Kaiser Permanente, how you prioritize um, what you decide to test and um, even in the other uh, academic settings, how you decide if it's solely based on funding, if there are committees looking at this. I'm from Kaiser in Southern California and we have that same perspective that it's really difficult to choose what to do next and where to use your resources. So. So is the question on what we, how we decide to test or how we, what we decide to actually tackle? To tackle, okay. Um, well, early on, um, right now, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit that are pretty powerful. Like, it's hard to say no to medication administration. It's hard to say no to nurse communication. See, these things are just fundamentally broken, and those are easy to say, we're going to do that and we'll take it on. Um, we're now getting... We have a few more low-hanging fruit that we can probably tackle, and then we'll start needing better mechanisms for prioritization. Right now, the way we do prioritize, though, is we're looking for um, problems that are big and universal. So we're not looking for a problem that one unit or one hospital has, but we want the problem for the whole industry. We want the problem that, um, and that multiple organizations would be willing to collaborate on because we're also looking for universal design. So we don't want to attack a singular problem. We also don't want to attack something that would just provide a, a solution just for one or two people. So that's currently how we're prioritizing. We will come up with a better way of actually what is the thing, but we're, right now we're still lucky. We're only five years old, so there's a lot of fruit out there. Um. So I just wanted to say, actually, it's, it's sort of an answer to both this question and the previous question. So my answer to the previous question is a gift with purchase is usually a very great incentive. Um, and to, for this question, I think um, until you have a good picture of what's going on, you don't know what the, what the big problems really are. And finding ways of, of collecting and displaying the data so that someone can actually see uh, in a holistic way, what's really happening. So, for example, Renata's, I mean, if you, if you know how to read Petri net diagrams, um, then probably looking at Renata's diagram of how that whole hospital operation would be incredibly illuminating. Um, so with our project, very early on, we developed a way to uh, graphically display the entire medication history of an ICU patient, which, according to the ICU people, they had, they had never, ever seen <coughs> before what are the medications that they give a patient. And there are more than, for this one patient that we started with, there were more than 50 medications. It was 35 days. I think there were 14,000 drug administrations for this patient, and about more than 200 infusions. So um, we were able to show all that basically in, in one screen in a way that within 10 seconds they realized that whenever he was paralyzed, they stopped giving him pain medication. Why is that? Well, because when he's paralyzed, he can't express pain. Uh, yeah. So... Um, they realized that they're really traumatizing most of their patients uh, by stopping the, the analgesics when the patients have paralytics. Uh, and that took literally 10 seconds after they saw the display. So if you can find a way of getting a holistic graphical display of what's happening in a system or in, in the care of a patient, then it's often obvious some, some of the things you can tackle. Ravi, and then back at the back. You may have just answered the question, but I'll ask it for the rest of the panel, perhaps. Um, what occurs to me is that in all of the approaches, there's varying levels of intelligence, and it's either distributed in, in the model. For example, Eric, the, the distributed model may be that the acquisition is distributed from the people who actually make the decisions. And in Stuart, yours might be is, is a question of where you actually embed the intelligence to be most actionable. But I'm, I'm really sort of wondering how you make that decision of embedding the intelligence in the process of care. And, um, and you know, for, in, in maybe computational ability, in your case, Stuart, might be the biggest factor. I mean, how, how big of a computational footprint do you need to make this analysis in real time? Or can it even be made in real time? And maybe, Chris, from your standpoint, if you're designing the healthcare process, the, the, the key is to get good care, but there's a series of decisions that need to be maintained in order to get that good care. So I imagine there's a point at which you try to engineer the intelligence so you get that. Mm -hmm. So in all your cases, what constrains that decision and, uh, and what helps you figure out where to, where to put it? I can start. So I think in, in our case, it's, uh, you know, because, because the need is so immense, it's kind of you know, how, how far down the chain can we, can we make the appropriate decision? Like if we can get, you know, software on the phone to process something automatically, then, you know, and, and the alternative is, you know, having, having a healthcare worker there who's already overburdened, then it'd be great to get, you know, the, the software to process it automatically. 
Um, but you know, if it is if it is something that that requires more more expert uh, analysis, then you know, moving that either you know um, to to someone there in a in a easier look at fashion maybe, or um, you know, the way that, that that we've been looking at it so far is is moving it off site, where you know that that expertise is more abundant, and you know, people might have the bandwidth to be able to you know process that and, and meet that need. I will try. <laughs> Um, so uh, again, a lot of what we're coming up with is um, experience design and, and the, the feeling that we get when we interact with our healthcare systems. And at least right now, um, the way we measure that is um, through direct observation, which is a heck of a lot of work um, and a lot of time commitment, especially as we scale these things up, because how do you pay attention all the time to the behaviors that are happening? Um, so we try to do the minimal, the minimal we need to do um, to understand uh, where the process is. So for example, in KP MedWrite, um, it, there's 25 steps for KP MedWrite, which is actually pretty small compared to um, uh, some of the processes that we've seen other nurses go through for their good medication administration. So we've tried to lean it down, make it easy, simple to understand, but of those 25, we feel there's 10 really compelling ones that must be um, administered properly. And so we do direct observation randomly throughout the month on all the units to, to see if these things are happening in the correct order. Um, we don't have a way to track that, uh, to automate that yet. That I think that would be the next level of sophistication, but we're just not there yet. I have a small comment too. I think, I think it's also really important to see that humans and computers at good at very, very different things. So you should, again, in your intelligence system, make it distributed like, like, like you pointed out. So let the computers do the kind of task that the computers are pretty good at. And then keep, keep involving humans in, in the loop in, in the cases where, where they, they actually have the strength and, and power. So it's not kind of like making it all intelligent or making it all, all human-centered, but, but kind of finding, finding the best of both worlds. And I think a little bit in this also is part of, part of some of the observation requirements are getting people to buy into the actual behaviors that are going on either prior to the change or during the change or after the change. Um, and, and it's to that sometimes you don't need a lot of data. You just need some acknowledgement that some of the issues exist. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, back, back in the back. <clears throat> um. I'm just curious, do the panel, are the panelists aware of the term black swans? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear I'm that. sorry, we didn't hear you. Are you familiar with the term black swans? Black swans. Can someone no. define? I don't, I don't think we use that term in this section. I'm having a moment. Okay. I don't know. It's, um, back in the 1900s when they were developing a biological system in England, it, they assumed that swans were white. And then all of a sudden they went to Australia and they found black swans. So they had to go back and re-change re their, their system. And I'm curious, when the systems that you're developing, how do you handle when you run across black swans? The reason I'm asking is I'm classified as a quadriplegic, even though I, I don't feel a lot of parameters of being a quadriplegic. So when I go into most medical systems, they don't know how to handle me because they don't fit me in any box. So I can I can try to end, uh, give you an answer. I don't know if it's exactly what you're asking, but but again, I think for, uh, to to take a, a a concrete example, we're des we're designing something for the the waiting area in the emergency department, and our kind of hypothesis was that all the patient in the waiting area wanted to know how long they had to wait until they were seen by a doctor. That was kind of like a, all the sw swans are white. Then we, we showed it to the nurses down, uh, down, down at the emergency units and they were kind of terrified. They were kind of seeing a riot if this system were put into use because what the patient wanted was they wanted to know the exact waiting sign if it was only going down. It, if it at some point were going up, they will kind of come right to the nurse and complain about it because even, even though there were kind of a, a, a family with a small child and it was late in the evening and something like that. If there were, were a person that had been waking for two hours or something like that, there was no kind of 
respect for, for changing kind of the waiting order or something like that. And this was an example where we were sent, sent back again and saying, this is just not good enough. The world is, is not like you, you think it is. You have to, to re-evaluate your design based, based on this experience. Any other questions? Well, join me in thanking the panel for this lively discussion. Please thank me in uh, thanking our moderator, Barbara Harvath. Uh, so we're at the end of our uh, our session, uh, and this is uh, essentially a, a ver I'll make this a very brief uh, wrap up and closing. Um, the intent of this whole uh, whole conference uh, was to look at ways in which we can improve uh, the service, the service of healthcare, and I think we've uh, managed to do that pretty well. Uh, I've actually had a few requests to do this again, which. Uh, quite frankly, I don't want to think about uh, for a little while, but I think we'll, we'll certainly consider it. Um, we've looked at sort of technological means that act as a platform for service uh, in the workshop. We looked at, a, it, is there such a thing as a laboratory for services? We have product labs, but can we in fact have a service laboratory? Uh, we also considered um, uh, the actual ways and techniques you can improve it from the human and behavioral all the way down to the computational. So uh, it makes for a very uh, interesting set. Uh, sadly, we, um, there are many people here that we would love to have had uh, that, that couldn't make it, and I think uh, maybe with some advanced planning we might be able to do that. Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming, um, and uh, we're officially adjourned, and you're certainly welcome to stay for a short reception outside, and again on the terrace, and uh, have some discussions with our speakers and amongst yourselves. So thank you very much, and please look for the slides uh, on, and the um, uh, presentations on YouTube and the Citrus channel.